we are going to be talking about these global power dynamics that we've heard so much about uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, this morning, yesterday. Uh, th this strain on uh, and competition between the big powers is really having a negative effect on what we do on non-proliferation and disarmament. I don't want to recap all the stresses that we have uh, on the system, uh, but clearly uh, the Russian withdrawal from multilateral solutions is a big aspect of that. Um, Russia withdrawing, from, uh, withdrawing its ratification from the CTBT, uh, but also putting a spanner in the wheel of all of our multilateral meetings and discussions that we have, um, uh, obstructing any, any conclusions or any way forward uh, by those that do want to move forward. Um, also, with China was rightfully mentioned as a challenge, um, very much a country we engage with, uh, but having a different narrative on peaceful users which is something that we push back on, and also sometimes attacking the integrity of multilateral institutions, such as the IAEA, when it concerns um, verification or the safeguards related to orcas or, or Alps treated waters. But I don't want to dwell too much on all these challenges, because I think we all know them all too well, and we can spend many conferences just, just lamenting them. Um, I'd rather focus on how we can deal uh, with, with the challenges in order to safeguard and improve the non-proliferation and disarmament architecture that it has, that we have, but also what it means for the prospect of further developing the architecture. Is it still working for us? Um, we have a lot of regional conflicts. Are they really regional? Um, and how do we adapt arms control and other instruments to the, the current strains and challenges? So in order to discuss that, I have four truly excellent speakers um, joining me here at, uh, at the table uh, from the UN, the US, France and the UK. I'd like to stress that we really made an effort to invite China to join us in this panel, uh, but unfortunately they, they declined and uh, could not participate. I'd like to very briefly um, introduce the, the speakers. At the far right is uh, Mr. Ade Ebo, uh, Director and Deputy to the High Representative of uh, UNODA. Uh, big welcome, uh, Ade. Thank you very much for coming over all the way from New York. To my right, Ambassador Bruce Turner, who is the US uh, Permanent Representative uh, to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. Then to my left, Guillaume Olagnier, Director of Strategic Affairs of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of France. Uh, and next to him is Rebecca Saga, who is the head of the Counterproliferation and Arms Control Center of FCDO. So thank you all very much uh, for joining us, panelists. Um, thank you for the audience. I'm happy you're all still here in great numbers. Um, I will give the um, a panelist each uh, a few minutes to make some initial remarks, and then we'll open up the discussion, uh, the Q and A in the room. And with that, I'd like to already um, uh, address the next generation that's present here uh, to already think about your questions, because what I want to do um, after the introductions is to give in the floor in the first round to the next generation to give them the opportunity to um, set the scene for us and for the rest of the discussions. With that, um, I'd like to flip the floor to you, Ade, as a first speaker. Thank you very much, Marlene. Thank you. Um, let me quickly pay a debt of gratitude uh, to the EU for this kind invitation. Also an expensive invitation. I saw the price of the ticket. Um, I don't um, and also, uh, seriously, for uh, collaboration with the European Union across all spectrum of our mandates, uh, I think is a very uh, productive uh, collaboration. And I am certainly very glad to be among this impressive community of practice. Um, 
I found it uh, very eye-opening to, as a non-European myself, to be part of the conversation of how Europeans see Europe um, and how this European part of the um, disarmament and non-proliferation jigsaw puzzle, uh, how that piece is, uh, is forming. And what I want to do is basically two and a half things. Uh, the half is, bas is basically to reiterate those developments that we call geostrategic changes and all that. Uh, not to repeat them, but to add a couple of new dimensions to them. Uh, and secondly, to answer the homework question of the impact on the prospect for non-proliferation and disarmament. And lastly, what we can call the so what question. What can we do about it? I think there is no doubt that we are living in a world that is complex, more complex than before. Uh, almost a world in which almost anything can happen. It's an uncertain world. Um, it's a world with more tensions, with new and emerging centers of power. Um, and as we have said, major power competition. We have also said that there's a decline of trust within and between states. I think we have spent a lot of time talking about the decline of trust between states. I don't think we have spent enough time talking about the decline of trust within states and how that affects the decline of trust between states. Uh, and, I, and, and I would really wish to be uh, questioned on that a bit later, but the decline of trust within states is part of the dynamic. Um, therefore, we are dealing with a context that has fewer guardrails, certainly on the nuclear question, uh, and greater danger. What we know as the, or we have known as the rules-based order is at an inflection point. And what, when I said I wanted to add a couple of dimensions, and I'll put it very uh, clearly, and I hope I'm not misunderstood. I suspect there is a new emerging, somewhat chaotic uh, political division of labor in which those actors who used to follow are now standing back and questioning their previous leaders. And the leaders are almost in a how dare you state of shock. And I think that is part of the dynamic that Europe is dealing with at the moment. I also think that we have not spent enough time thinking about the possible role of non-state actors. Uh, this the security conversation and multilateralism is no longer just about states. If you look at what is happening in various parts of the world, we see what uh, non-state actors, both for good and bad, can do. I also think we need to revisit what I call the big, big bang theory. The big bang theory is that, okay, if there's gonna be a world war, it's gonna be one huge conflict starting somewhere and engulf the whole world. I think it is possible that in the world we are in today, a world war can creep on us almost by installments. Uh, and I don't want to sound alarmist, but I think we need to walk back and redefine uh, our concepts and our assumptions about global tensions. One more thing I'd like to add about the global context. I think it's apparent to everyone what is happening, but I think the conclusions are not the same. For some, what is happening is some kind of glitch and somehow will recover, recover and go back to the norm. My contention is that no, what is happening is fundamental, is tectonic, is seismic, is irreversible and has far reaching consequences for mm -hmm. Europe and certainly for non-proliferation uh, and nuclear disarmament. 
the old days will never come back. On the other hand, there are those who think that, oh, they are now the new champions taking over from the old uh, drivers of the international system uh, and not recognizing how resilient some of those are. That too is false. I think what we are individual of actually is in a transitional phase between the old and the new. Um, yeah, I think transitional will be the nice way to put it. Perhaps more accurately, uh, a chaotic, disruptive context. Uh, and it's very difficult, therefore, to deal with such a context. So my appeal is that we need to be humble about the conclusions we reach at the moment, because these changes are still taking place. Um, and they will take place for some time to come, and they are not simply between states. So to the second homework question about the impact on prospect for non-proliferation and disarmament. The first one that strikes me is the risk of nuclear weapons being used being at the highest it has ever been for decades. Uh, dangerous rhetoric is on the rise, as we know, and the use of nuclear weapons as tools of coercion has also emerged as a worrying reality. States possessing nuclear weapons are shunning diplomacy for armament. As we all know, arms spending is at historically high levels, and many would admit that the nuclear taboo has become very fragile. Certainly, uh, and Izumi likes to say this, there's a qualitative nuclear arms race that is on. Every nuclear weapon state is modernizing, making their arsenals or trying to make them more accurate, faster, stealthier. So there is that qualitative nuclear arms race. But could, there also, could we also be on the verge of a quantitative arms race? Based on recent developments, the more than three decade trend of reductions in global numbers of arms, nuclear arms weapons may be coming to a close. If that trend were to be reversed, it would signal not only that we have forgotten the hard lessons of the Cold War, but that we are heading in an alarming direction. So it's not so much that the erosion of the global order is continuing. I think what is most disturbing is that we don't really see a particular light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and that is, uh, is alarming. So we can say what we want about the post-Cold War order, but there we had some um, structures in place that helped us to address the risk of this calculation uh, and so on that are now uh, disappearing, if you like. The pillars of multilateral efforts to achieve a world free of nuclear weapons, such as the CTBT or the MPT, of course, continue to play that role, but I think it would be fair to say that they are under enormous assault. The TPNW gives some, some hope, but it's still at its infancy. For sure, if the New START treaty expires without a successor in 2026, there will be no caps left on nuclear weapons. And that is pretty much scary. Now, across the world, regional conflicts with nuclear overtones also threaten disaster. It's especially true in the Middle East and Asia-Pacific, Asia-Pacific, this was discussed yesterday, where strategic chains could drag in other nuclear armed states. Both of these regions are home to growing numbers of sophisticated weapon systems, and as we reminded yesterday, neither has the architecture required to reduce risk and maintain stability. Now, in the European context, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the threat of veiled threat or veiled threats of nuclear weapons use has been the most acute symptom of these trends. 
It has served to spike nuclear risk, contaminated prospect of arms control, and undermined the non-proliferation regime. The conflict has also revived the dangerous narrative that had Ukraine kept the nuclear weapons stationed on its territory, it would have deterred Russian invasion. This not only undermines non-proliferation, it reinforces the falsity that nuclear weapons provide the ultimate protection. The conflict has demonstrated that nuclear weapons add an existential level of terror to regional conflicts. So now to the third and the last part of my homework question. So what? What can we do? Um, for the United Nations, uh, the SD is clear about, I think someone called it idealism, uh, and his goal is the elimination of nuclear weapons. But to be real, and he has made some uh, recommendations uh, in his new agenda for peace that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but I'm not going to bore you with all those recommendations. I just want to outline four broad recommendations that I think could be uh, immediate to uh, medium-term efforts to answer the so what question. But just to say that for the United Nations, the question is not fundamentally about weapon systems. The question is fundamentally a human question. And the deficits in trust, in solidarity, and universality. And within that is a nuclear question. So it's not the other way around. Uh, and wh what the SG is saying in the new agenda for peace is that if the human race wants to get back on track on that goal of elimination of nuclear weapons, try to build trust, try to build solidarity, and try to build universality. You will not get the answer to the strategic questions without those human elements. With that in mind, I just make four quick recommendations. First, I think we need to protect the regime designed to bring about the ultimate elimination of nuclear weapons. This means reinforce, reinforcing both the MPT and the CTBT. Um, and I'm not very good at Lord of the Rings, but um, I, I, I do share the core message that uh, that was that was shared yesterday. Uh, the, NT, the MPT and the CTBT are really two key pillars uh, that we need to uh, protect. I also think that we have to find a way to commence negotiations on the long overdue treaty prohibiting the production of fissile material for nuclear weapons. Now, this means that both the critics and the supporters of the TPNW need to find a way of working together in which they can acknowledge their differences but also find common ground. So even if it is experiencing some turbulence, I think the NPT remains and likely will remain for a while the load-bearing pillar of the entire regime. I think that future gains will not be possible without a robust NPT, and one, I must add, that delivers across all the three pillars of disarmament, non-proliferation, and the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Um, again, the issue of, of, uh, of whether the tripod is balanced it's one that uh, we can revisit later. Secondly, I would like to urge all states to support the international organizations mandated to carry out disarmament and non-proliferation. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and the IAEA, they need the requisite political, financial, and human resources to carry out their ever-increasing workload. Thirdly, with a view to long-term disarmament gains, I think there's an urgent need to develop and establish 
near-term measures to prevent any use of nuclear weapons. And this could be uh, include transparency and confidence-building measures. I had a reference to a political military code of conduct. Um, I think the OSCE has this. Um, I studied this years ago. I think it is a very interesting uh, document. In any way, we need CBMs. We need crisis communication systems. Uh, and above all, we need dialogue. We need to talk, 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 and not be tired of talking. At the regional level, uh, and again, going back to the discussion yesterday, I think that we should ensure predictable regional frameworks that respond to the needs of each regional context. Fourth, I think it is vital for both the United States and the Russian Federation to return to the full implementation of New START and that the nuclear weapon state commence discussions on what kind of arms control framework will succeed the, uh, succeed the treaty come 2026. Now, uh, what it will look like, of course, it's not clear, it's complex, but I would suggest that the increasingly multipolar nuclear order requires a, multi, a more multipolar approach to arms control. It will be a complex undertaking, of course, especially given the disparity in experience and expertise, but I think that is why dialogue is necessary. I'd also suggest that future arms control frameworks address the issue of all categories of nuclear weapons. The proliferation of non-strategic nuclear weapons, I think, requires a response. The perception that these weapons are somehow less harmful could not be further from the truth. I think that rather there is the prospect of mistake, of miscalculation and escalation. I also believe that future frameworks should also cover defense systems, including missile defenses. Finally, future arms control agreements should confront the potentially catastrophic nexus between nuclear weapon and emerging technologies and domains of warfare. I would conclude by saying that, of course, anyone who looks at the global headlines today knows that our world is in a flux, and one that is increasingly dominated by geostrategic competition. But we should not forget to learn from the lessons of the past, not least the indelible role played by disarmament and non-proliferation arms control in creating a safer and more secure world. Yes, of course, the current situation is more complex, very complex, more than ever before, but complexity should be no excuse for inaction. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for that uh, introduction, Ade, and, and when you said there is no light at the end of the tunnel, uh, my heart sank a little bit. But I'm happy that you then proposes a very ambitious uh, agenda with a lot of elements, uh, including the, the dialogue and the talking elements. And I think this conference is part of that process, um, not between so much between states, but with um, a broader community. I'd like now like to turn to Bruce. Yep. How do you see things? No, thank you very much. Um, I want to start by thanking Otto Ade for providing us with a, a very comprehensive, almost philosophical uh, look at some of the challenges we're facing. I'm going to take a somewhat narrower approach to arms control and, and, and global dynamics, but I think they're, they're very complementary in the end. Uh, the U.S. view is that arms control is always relevant and important, even when we face the significant challenges we're facing today. I have divided those challenges into three clusters. Uh, one which I call specific proximate causes, one shifting global geopolitics, and the third uh, new technologies, including technologies being used for disinformation purposes. I will then turn to what some of the th some things that we can do to, to start to address some of them, um, as I was very very much like to end up in a positive place. <laughs> um, but I but I look forward to the questions and discussion that will follow. So. 
starting with with proximate causes, many, many of which you are already are already well known, but they're still worth repeating to some some extent. Russia indisputably tops the list with its ongoing and brutal war of aggression against Ukraine, during which it has employed irresponsible nuclear rhetoric, endangered the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, purported to suspend the New START treaty, and withdrawn its ratification of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So that's quite a litany there. Adding its withdrawal from the CFE Treaty, Russia has undermined the key arms control principles of reciprocity, transparency, compliance, and verification, which for decades constituted the bedrock of the Euro-Atlantic security architecture and the global non-proliferation regime, nuclear non-proliferation regime. Actions from the People's Republic of China are also very concerning. The PRC is rapidly and opaquely building a larger, more diverse nuclear arsenal that will reach, according to our estimates, over 1,000 operational nuclear warheads by 2030. Beijing's continued refusal to acknowledge this buildup or its scale calls into question its intentions. The PRC also remains the only nuclear weapon state not to have put in place a moratorium on the production of fissile material for use in nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. And it's also, of course, blocking negotiations on an FMCT uh, in the Conference on Disarmament. The DPRK, aided and abetted by Russia and the PRC, continues its unlawful nuclear weapon and ballistic missile programs, threatening international peace and security and the global nonproliferation regime. Iran continues to refuse to fully answer questions from the IAEA about indications of possible undeclared nuclear material and activities on its territory while growing its nuclear program in deeply concerning ways. Taken together, the activities of these countries have put under stress the NPT as the cornerstone for preventing the proliferation of nuclear weapons and the foundation for progress on nuclear disarmament, leading, us, leading to deepening divisions within and among various groups of states as we look to the next NPT review conference in 2026. Second, Global geopolitics are also shifting, as many countries sense an opportunity to expand their influence, leading to a more crowded international field of competing power centers. The PRC is attempting to bend the international rules-based order to its own advantage in order to dominate its region and the global south, while Russia is challenging it frontally, not hesitating to abuse its veto power to hold multilateral institutions hostage and challenge our ability to manage crises, whether in the Middle East or elsewhere, or globally in dealing with climate change and potential pandemics. Third, we are confronted with rapidly evolving, game-changing new technologies. Artificial intelligence is on everyone's mind to include its role in an act, already active role of, of dis, war of disinformation. Space is becoming ever more congested and contested. Also looming large are the risks of new biological weapons. All of these tech technologies are dual use in nature. The obvious question for all of us, Sorry, my that's story. all right, is what we do about all these challenges. Part of the answer in our view lies in arms control. As President Biden has said, no matter what is happening in the world, the United States is ready to pursue critical arms control measures. What that means is that the United States is ready to work constructively with Russia on a pathway back to full implementation of the New START Treaty, and we will continue to seek a post-2026 nuclear arms control framework. Likewise, we continue to seek mutually beneficial bilateral discussions with the PRC on ways to promote strategic stability and reduce tensions. We also believe it is important to make use of the most appropriate arms control tools for the moment. Comprehensive legally binding treaties are not the only arms control tools available. When the risk of nuclear conflict is as high as it's been in many years, we should look to the tools we have to reduce these risks. When the cost of misunderstanding is so high, we can work to improve transparency. This is why we are reaching out to engage both Russia and the PRC without preconditions. As the U.S. Ambassador to the Conference on Disarmament, 
and head of the U.S. delegation to the U.N. First Committee, I want to dwell a little bit further on the role of various multilateral tools. First, we believe it is urgent that we continue working together to uphold the international order. We must persuade both Russia and the PRC of the value of stability from the existing international rules-based order, including within the UN, and that it is not in their own long-term interest to challenge it at every opportunity. This requires that we also tend to the institutions involved. Multilateral institutions such as the UN First Committee and the Conference on Disarmament have important roles to play in the health and stability of the global arms control and nonproliferation regime. Abandoning them to obstruction and paralysis is not a solution. This does not mean they can or should be insulated from broader events, most notably the ongoing war in Ukraine, but also the Israel-Hamas conflict and tensions between the United States and the PRC. But nor can we allow them to be held hostage by Russia, Iran, or anyone else. I am not talking here of doing away with consensus on matters of international security, but rather the practice of cynically exploiting the rules of procedure to block progress even on non-substantive matters. There are also other steps we can take, beginning with the need to insist on facts as the basis for discussion. We cannot allow disinformation and fanciful narr narratives to distort and di divert our work. Secondly, let's work on what is realistically possible today in arms control and not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Our focus should include not just broad treaties, but also more limited, tailored measures that can reduce risks or create norms of responsible behavior. That is why we are pursuing nuclear risk reduction within the P5. Our UN First Committee resolutions addressing the use of radiological weapons this year and anti-satellite testing last year are further examples. Emerging technologies are another area where a step-by-step -step approach might be best. Our political declaration on the responsible military use of artificial intelligence and autonomy and the inclusive international dialogue that was kicked off in New York last month represent crucial first steps toward building a shared understanding around norms of responsible behavior for the use of these capabilities. Our interest in norms and principles of responsi responsible behavior in space is another example of such an approach. Third. We need to take some practical steps to unblock our multilateral institutions. In Geneva, my team has circulated a set of modest ideas for improving the working methods of the Conference on Disarmament without altering the rules of procedure. The idea is to take some small steps to add continuity to our working methods, make them more efficient, and the CD more interactive. More broadly, our hope is to get the CD working again. Unfortunately, it's been more than 25 years since the CD took up a mandate to negotiate an effectively verifiable treaty banning the production of fissile material uh, for use in nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. Such a treaty would make a significant contribution towards preventing a nuclear arms race and enabling future arms control agreements and towards advancing nuclear disarmament. At a minimum, uh, we would like to see the CD take the step of negotiating a ban of st on state use of radiological weapons. Continued paralysis risks producing maximalist approaches, such as the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons that are detached from the realities of the security environment and will never meet their own objectives. And then finally, the Secretary General's new agenda for peace, which Director Ebo has addressed, uh, maybe not in great detail, but somewhat, in our view provides vital context, substance, and thoughtful analysis on the challenges currently faced by the international community. The brief makes clear the vital importance of arms control and past efforts to reduce nuclear risks, calling for such work to continue, including through transparency, confidence-building measures, and dialogue. We welcome the inclusion of this element in the brief and support continued efforts in these directions. We also support the brief's call for efforts to strengthen the machinery of disarmament. To conclude, the United States is and will remain a champion of arms control, disarmament, and nonproliferation efforts be it the UN, in the MPT review process, in Geneva, or elsewhere. We will continue to work closely with our friends and allies, including the EU, to that end. Uh, this is, in fact, our greatest strength, is to have friends and allies in dealing with these issues. The global power dynamic poses challenges, but they must be overcome. The longer we wait, the more treacherous 
the road ahead will become. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce, for, for those words, and, and especially for the positive attitude towards Amscot Hall uh, from the side of the United States, despite these adverse uh, circumstances. And uh, by taking a number of positive steps in trying to make progress uh, on the multilateral front. But with that, I'm going to turn to Guillaume. Um, uh, Guillaume, please. Thank you, Marjolaine. And, uh, uh, hello to everybody. Happy to be here, and not only because my travel from Paris was cheaper than the one from <laughs> the DGs from, from New York, and you know, uh, less carbon producing than uh, the one of <laughs> or calling for UNODA. And thank you for the EU NPD and the IAI for this invitation. It is great to take part of that panel, in particular in the third position, because I have only to complement what has already been said that I share absolutely, uh, completely. Just three remarks from my side. The first is that we are in a complex situation in which we should try to re-establish a little bit clarity, at least on two points. The first is that if the whole um, arms control and disarmament architecture is falling apart, it is blatantly and obviously um, uh, at the first rank, the responsibility of Russia. It is something that we have to restate regularly because there are some, sometimes, you know, a little bit, lines are a little bit blurring and it is sometimes not that clear that the first responsibility is in Moscow in the fact, for example, that uh, the OECE, which has been for decades the appropriate forum to deal with European security and stability, is now blocked as we have uh, seen again last week in Skopje during the Ministerial uh, Council of the OEC. So we have to be very much clear on this, in particular because Russia has, you know, a, a great success in trying to defend its own narrative, which is that we are the one responsible for the war in Ukraine, the end of a number of important treaties, the de-ratification of the CTBT by, by Russia, and so on. But the first point on which we have to be clear, the second is that this architecture is not a Western construct which has been designed and pushed by Western countries only to defend their own interests, and that Russia and other countries should have been obliged to join in the past against their will. The reality is that um, it is absolutely willingly that Russia has uh, uh, agree to the so-called Helsinki uh, 10 principles in 1975 of the uh, Charter of Paris in uh, 1990 and to the UN Charter in 1945, even if those documents have been signed in uh, San Francisco, Paris and Helsinki. But it's not because of the cities that it is only Western construct, it is uh, you know, universal norms and principles which, uh, which are in the interest of every uh, country in the world. And it is, again, something that um, is much debated and sometimes, um, uh, you know, um, uh, harshly discussed in international fora. Just to take an example, many countries are arguing that the non-proliferation rules in terms of nuclear uh, equipments are designed to prevent a number of countries outside Europe and the United States to fully uh, use um, uh, nuclear uh, civil uh, uh, energy, for example, which is blatantly false, but it is the kind of disinformation that uh, we are facing. And so, in that context, we need, I think, clarity on our narrative, which is that there is one pr pr primary responsibility in the and the mining of the security architecture and of the arms control architecture, which is not only but uh, for a, a, a large part Russia, and second, that this architecture is in the interest of everybody. This, my second point is that that action by Russia and other countries to undermine and to disconstruct the arms control and disarmament architecture 
as um, wide-scale effects in Europe and outside Europe. Just to name a few, we, we see uh, direct consequences in the proliferation crisis, for example, uh, be it about chemical weapons, for example, in Syria, uh, the OPCW has succeeded in making a new decision on Syria uh, recently during the uh, state parties conference, but it is obvious that the undermining of the ability to act uh, on the side of the OPCW is something which facilitates the violation of the Chemical Weapon Convention by a number of countries, for example, Syria. On the nuclear side, uh, needless to recall the situation in which we are in Iran, for example, with a latest uh, report by the uh, IAE uh, Director General, which has reconfirmed how much Iran refused to cooperate with the IAEA and to respect uh, the uh, commitments that it had made. Uh, and the same in North Korea. It will be even more difficult to contain the willingness of North Korea to have a nuclear arsenal than it is more and more difficult to have a consensus uh, in the United Nations Security Council to condemn North Korea. And it is because of the position of Russia and China in that uh, in that uh, circumstance. So proliferation uh, issues, but also um, the consequences of that situation is uh, can be observed in terms of division between, again, uh, uh, a number of Western countries and non-Western countries. I, I'm referring in particular to discussion within the context of the NPT uh, with a growing sense of kind of opposition between uh, Western countries and, and over, based again on false affirmation that we are defending only a Western uh, construct uh, in terms of arms control and, and disarmament. So that situation has a very uh, wide uh, scaled and far-reaching consequences. In that context, it is my third point, what to do. I do agree with ADDG that we have to talk, 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 even if in the short term it's not really um, fruitful, but we have to continue to make it clear that at any time we are open to any discussion without preconditions on uh, how to re refine, to, to come back to a kind of negotiation to go back to a, a, a more solid uh, arms control and, and disarmament structure. I just want to highlight the example of nuclear issues because the United States, just as Bruce has recalled, has openly uh, opened the door to any, non, uh, mm -hmm. without precondition, any discussion with Russia about how to deal with the post-2026 in terms of uh, nuclear uh, disarmament and arms control. So it is exactly what, what we think is necessary to do. It, it is the same with uh, China, for example, and I think that a number of our countries are trying to engage China, including on strategic stability and on nuclear issues without precondition just to, you know, have uh, channels open and to try to to make progress without short-term uh, expectation. Second, um, we have to explain again and again that all this construct is not only a European issue, it's not only Western construct, it is in the benefit of everybody. And I think that it is difficult today to clearly anticipate all possible consequences of what we observe in Ukraine, I mean a nuclear uh, weapon state using uh, immoral and dangerous uh, nuclear uh, rhetoric to sustain a military conventional effort to invade uh, for a sovereign neighboring country. It is very difficult to imagine now the consequences, the possible consequences of China blatantly, rapidly and significantly increasing its military uh, nuclear buildup without any kind of transparency or discussion about 
this issue. And so really we are facing a situation which is not only a European or Western issue, but a global uh, challenge. And the last element I think is that we have in that context to be patient because we have to remember that new, uh, disarmament discussions, arms control discussions have never created a kind of softening of international relations. They have been followed by a softening of international relations. And so we have to be patient and to wait for the conditions being again met to have a discussion on strategic stability. And meanwhile, we have to uh, preserve, preserve the basement of the architecture which has been um, destroyed or eroded. And this basement is basically the values, principles that we have agreed, that we, we have universally agreed on at the moment, which are more, uh, you know, um, pertinent than ever, and that we have to preserve in that context till uh, we are again in a situation uh, when uh, discussion on strategic stability and uh, arms control uh, will be again uh, possible. And I finish here. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Guillaume, for those so three, three points uh, on, on the way forward. Uh, and, and especially the part about being open to discussions without preconditions and talk, 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 um, I think is a, is a, a very positive one. Uh, but with that, we turn to Rebecca. Please. Thank, thank you very much, Maria Line, and I join everybody uh, on the panel in thanking very much the EU Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium for the invitation today and for this uh, fantastic event and an opportunity to hear from lots of different voices. Uh, about their perspectives on the international security environment as we find it, and indeed how we hope it could be. Um, the UK is really happy to participate. Um, it's always difficult going last, especially because I agree with everything that, that uh, my fellow yeah. panellists have said, but nevertheless, the UK will uh, set out uh, a few um, uh, comments from, from our, our national perspective as well. Um, and I thought it would be helpful to um, just share some of the reflections from our own uh, uh, integrated review, uh, which we uh, set in 2021, but indeed refreshed this March and sets out, I think, for the UK, our um, uh, response to the challenging international environment in which we find ourselves. So we first published the review in 2021 to set out our overarching national security and international strategy and to bring together uh, defence, security, resilience, diplomacy, development and trade. Uh, that identified four trends that we thought would uh, shape the international environment up until 2030. Uh, it included shifts in the distribution of global power, interstate systemic competition over the nature of, inter of the international order, rapid technological change and worsening transnational challenges. Now, this year, we only two years later, had to set out a refresh to that strategy already. Uh, we published the refresh because we wanted to reflect the pace at which those trends had accelerated. The transition to a multipolar, fragmented and contested world happened more definitively than we'd anticipated. <clears throat> and the drivers of this acceleration were manifold. Firstly, of course, Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. In 2020, one, we set out that Russia was the most acute threat to the UK's security. Uh, what has changed since then, not only the invasion, is that our collective security is now intrinsically linked to the outcome of the conflict in Ukraine. The review also recognises the growing prospect that the international and security environment will further deteriorate in the coming years. The risk of escalation is greater than at any time in decades, and there's an increasing number of advanced weapons systems have been developed and are being tested or adapted, uh, adopted. The strategic stability mechanisms that helped in the 21st century to mitigate the risks of misunderstanding, miscalculation, <laughs> and unintended escalation have not developed at the pace needed to ensure that competition does not spill over into uncontrolled conflict. Tensions in the Indo-Pacific are increasing. The threat from Iran has increased, as demonstrated by its advancing nuclear program and its regionally destabilizing behavior. And the DPRK 
is seeking to develop its nuclear capabilities while pursuing regionally destabilizing activity through missile tests that threaten its neighbours and indeed recent satellite launches as well. The UK strategy refresh responds to the intensification of systemic competition, now we believe the dominant geopolitical trend and main driver of the deteriorating security environment. A growing convergence of authoritarian states are challenging the basic conditions for an open, stable and peaceful international order. China's deepening partnership with Russia and Russia's growing cooperation with Iran and recently with DPRK in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine are of grave concern to all of us. More positively, and perhaps as a consequence of systemic competition, is renewed purpose and cooperation among allies. The strength of our collective response in support of Ukraine has demonstrated we remain willing and able to act decisively in defence of our common security, an open international order, international law and indeed the UN Charter. The enduring set strength of the European family has also been reaffirmed. Managing such systemic competition is essential to uphold strategic stability. A clear understanding of others' strategic calculus and an ability to explain our own is critical to avoid miscalculation. Reg regular strategic level dialogues are important to build confidence and transparency around security ambition, vital interests and military doctrines. During the Cold War, such mechanisms gave all parties a higher level of confidence that we would not miscalculate our way into nuclear exchange. The UK seeks to maintain and establish reliable lines of political and military communication so that in moments of heightened tension, we have quick and effective means by which to de-escalate or indeed to manage escalation. This is a long-term endeavour and of course well-established channels with Russia are limited and under significant strain but we remain ready to reinvigorate them when the moment is right. The P5 process under the NPT for example has continued since Russia's invasion precisely because of that essential need to preserve the space for better understanding of doctrine and to promote concrete steps for risk reduction. And bilaterally, the UK and China held our first substantive CP dialogue for five years in September this year. And of course, I note and, and welcome that China has held other similar dialogues with the US, Netherlands and, China, and Germany, among others, uh, with more European dialogues to come. In an age of systemic competition, we must double down on our work to avoid what some have termed as an inevitable proliferation. Uh, historically, arms control has consisted of a set of regimes imposing limits on specific capabilities alongside that, those strategic stability dialogues focused on risk reduction. But developing our thinking on integrated arms control, drawing together a wider set of actors, will be important. The existing international architecture, for example, the Chemical Weapons Convention, the Biological Weapons Convention, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, are all vital and must be protected, promoted and, of course, implemented but we will seek to build upon existing architecture, supporting up updates to existing agreements, regulating specific capabilities where appropriate, and we'll look for opportunities to create new agreements where useful and achievable. In doing this, we will expand thinking beyond states to industry experts, companies, and technologists, all of whom play a critical role in understanding risks and opportunities, including particularly in dual use uh, technology. Uh, it's also important that they are involved in setting the standards that, that can govern them. The UK hosted last month an AI safety summit that aimed to do just that, to bring together governments, academia and industry, both to better understand emerging risks and also to aid common work to counter them, including at that summit the particular risks uh, posed by AI on biosecurity. We have to have a pragmatic approach and focus on establishing and regulating behaviours the UK has championed such a process in the UN on cyber and space because while for now arms control binding leading new arms control binding legal frameworks remain our long term goal we absolutely have to acknowledge there's no immediate prospect of all the major powers coming together to establish new agreements but i don't want to end on a negative down note and it's always difficult to put perhaps this session as the final one of your conference uh, there have got to be some cause for optimism, and I think actually the fact that so many people are gathered together today to, to talk about this and to find ways through is testament to that. Um, some ideas building, again, on, on comments from my colleagues of where we can work, rather than focusing on where the difficulties are. 
are that we'll, while we continue to um, pursue new formal agreements to regulate capabilities, and that has to be our goal, uh, whilst the conditions don't allow for that, it doesn't mean we do nothing. Uh, we need to have a pr pragmatic focus on establishing and regulating behaviours where we can uh, and prepare the ground for formal agreements uh, that we very much hope will be possible in the future. Uh, as Guillaume has said, we need to talk, talk, talk. We must widen that conversation as well. We need to build and maintain stability, uh, but, but that's in every nation's interests, and there must be a shared pool of responsibility to do this. We need to think beyond states to industry experts, company and technologists as well. We must create and preserve space for channels for dialogue to build trust and counter disinformation. Trust and transparency through dialogue should also mean that we can be more active in calling out non-compliance and bad behaviour where we see it. And finally, we should renew and strengthen confidence building measures. Confidence and trust grow when states are open about their military capabilities and plans. To strengthen confidence building measures, we have the opportunities presented by new technology to improve our capabilities to identify, share and verify information. And as a final, finally, uh, the new agenda for peace uh, that uh, the Secretary General has, has presented and indeed the very consultative way that uh, he has gone about drawing up that agenda uh, also offers huge hope, I think, for uh, states to come together and broaden that conversation about what our priorities should be for the rest of this century and beyond. And that's, again, something that the UK very much supports. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, uh, especially also for trying to en end on a positive note and forward look taking a forward-looking approach uh, and, and also mentioning again the, um, uh, the issue of dialogue, um, widening the conversation and talk, talk, talk. <laughs> And with that, I'd like to open the floor. Um, as I said, this first round is for the next generation. And I see my own dear mentee. So she is going to be first. And then the lady behind her. Um, uh, sorry? You're not next generation. <laughs> <laughs> you are more the next meeting. And then. Uh, Yes, the first round is for Next Generation, then the third one there, and the fourth one there. So, uh, please, first Beatrice. Um, thank you. So, I'm Beatrice from France, and my question is for Mr. Lanier. Um, so, France is one of the few countries with a feminist foreign policy, um, and I was wondering how it was uh, actually implemented in France's approach to arms control, and if you um, saw any positive impact of gender mainstreaming in the context of arms control since its adoption in 2019. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take a few questions and then go back to the panel. So right, right behind uh, Beatrice. Uh, hi, um, my name is Darina. I'm from Georgia and I'm also a mentee. Um, uh, I would like to ask a question to Mr. Ebo about, uh, you mentioned the trust deficit and trust between states, and we usually talk about superpowers and their role, but I want, I want you to um, uh, tell us what you think about the middle powers, because sometimes these powers, for example, in the Middle East, they try to uh, increase their influence without aligning their foreign policies to a single superpower. For example, after the invasion of Ukraine, um, they didn't show actually support to a to a single superpower. Um, so, not taking the sides, you know, this uh, this question. I would like uh, to ask you, like, what's your perspective? On what's the role of middle powers um, uh, for maybe in the future? Like, what's the potential to contribute to uh, to contribute positively in the future? Thank you. Thank you for that question, and then we'll go over there. If you can get the microphone. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Clara. I'm also part of the uh, mentorship program. And uh, my question is, we, we heard a lot about um, emerging challenges and uh, mostly uh, pertaining to AI and emerging technologies. Um, but my question would be to what extent um, 
do the changes we will experience um, due to climate crisis induced um, changes in boundary conditions and the general security situation feature in these conversations that uh, you mentioned. Thank you very much. Yep, very good question. And then we had a final one, um, gentlemen, also in that block. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alexander Guionis. I'm uh, with the Harvard Sussex program. Um, at the Conference of States Parties last week at the OPCW, uh, the US delegation showed a video which was circulated originally on Russian TV of the use of tear gas uh, against Ukrainian soldiers. Um, this was dropped from a drone, fairly murky kind of image. And um, EU and many other states raised concerns about this. And I think you know this conflict obviously poses a threat to chemical weapon prohibitions through potential use of riot control agents or other chemical agents, of course, and becoming a test ground really for this creeping legitimization of chemical weapon use. So really, what, what do you think of these sort of allegations and what can be done? Because states actually utilized some of the uh, clarification mechanisms under the convention, but they were unhappy with Russian responses. So really, as you know, the question is, what next? So what? What can be done? And the reason I ask, I think, is because there's a real concern for this sort of nibbling or scratching or sort of eroding at some of the fundamental legal norms and taboos which we've taken for granted. And it's quite a slippery slope uh, on one of these regimes when you let these sort of things go or we can't find a way to deal with it. And that becomes pervasive across other regimes. So just interested to hear your take on what next with that sort of allegation. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. With those forward, we'll turn back to the, quan, uh, to the panel. It's, it's, it's wide-ranging. It's about gender aspects in nuclear deterrence. It's about the role of middle powers. It's about how climate crises factor into our discussions and also how to deal with non-compliance and, and the slippery slope we might get on if we don't deal with it effectively. Ada, can I turn to you first to... To well address to the question that was posed to you and, and what, yes. whatever you want to contribute to the other questions. Yeah, let me at least uh, try to answer the middle powers question. I think, well, at least from a political science perspective, uh, that's the very definition of being a middle power, that you have, you have attained enough power to afford not to have to choose between any other power. That's what makes you a middle power. If you still, have, if you still are constrained to align to one power or the other, you're not yet a middle power. Okay, so that's the very definition of a, of a middle power, conceptually speaking. But politically speaking, you give the example of the Middle East. Um, just to share with you the view from outside Europe, you gave the context of post-Ukraine uh, invasion of Ukraine by, by Russia. Part, if you followed the, the news at that time, especially on Al Jazeera and such channels, the discontent in the Middle East was that Middle Eastern refugees, particularly Syrian refugees, were treated, or they were perceived at least to have been treated differently from Ukrainian refugees, which did not sit well with them. So it's the particular context of Ukraine and Middle East, perhaps this was the thinking uh, as to why um, there wasn't this as, as much closeness as one would have wanted to see uh, from that from that part of the world, the the third element, if you are playing safe as a middle power, is that you really want to keep your friends and not make new enemies. Uh, what is the point? Uh, so, in order to avoid toxicity and to allow yourself to politically get the reward when everything has sort of settled down, you. You stand aside and watch and let them play, uh, play uh, each other out, and then you make your alliance. It doesn't make strategic sense to make your alliance when the big powers are still fighting. Otherwise, you get caught in the middle. So this is perhaps some of the 
political thinking uh, um, uh, with these countries that you call countries in the middle. But I actually have a conceptual problem with the concept of countries in the middle. Because in the world that we are in nowadays, um, and the way security has, if you like, been redefined, uh, being in the middle is something that's a bit hierarchical. Uh, and power is not always, it's become much more context dependent than hierarchy dependent. You know, so depending on who you are, um, and sometimes even take on climate change, whether you are a low-lying state or a high-lying state, gives you some power. So the calculation of power is not so much hierarchical today. So I have uh, some discomfort with the concept of middle powers because it, it uh, if you like, concretizes and keeps this hierarchical conception of power which actually is part of the problematic we are trying to solve. Uh, if, if security is indeed truly interconnected at various levels of security governance, uh, from the individual to the family, to the state, to the continental, to the global, then from that perspective, uh, power cannot be entirely just hierarchical because it is related, it, it is a, a human-centered perception of power, not a state. I think the uh, middle power concept for me is too state-centric to be applicable in the kind of world we are in today. I hope that helped a little bit. Just a couple of things. Um, on middle powers, I mean, it's clear that a lot of powers do not want to have to choose between the West and Russia and or China because, they, you know, they have trade with China, so they don't want to necessarily associate with one side or the other. Uh, and they're very unhappy about the fact that little by little they're being forced into that sort of a, a paradigm. I wanted to say a couple words about about trust and the trust deficit. It, it's a very tricky issue. I mean, you have the famous expression of Ronald Reagan that trust but verify. Uh, we're now in a situation where you have to verify in order to trust, but how do you get then to the verification? Uh, in our discussions with China, for instance, you know, the U.S. approach tends to be let's, let's do something, let's decide that we're, we're going to do something. If it's successful, that will help build trust. So you, you build trust by doing. Uh, the Chinese attitude tends to be, uh, we can't do anything until we trust you. So it's, it's one of these uh, situations where neither side can really find uh, the same language uh, to deal with the other side. So we will keep working on that. Um, I haven't seen the OPCW uh, video, uh, but um, I don't doubt, I mean, we are concerned about Russian use of, of riot control agents. But on the, on the wider question of compliance, I mean, compliance is, is of course, the, the weak spot of any treaty or any kind of, uh, of even a politically binding kind of an arrangement. You can build in consultation mechanisms. You can build in all kinds of things. That doesn't necessarily mean that some countries will adhere to them. And depending on the size of that country and the role of that country in an org organization, it becomes increasingly difficult to side sideline that country or to have a consensus minus sort of mechanism that you had in the OACE. Um, those are things you have to live with and, and, and work with. Uh, the first thing to do is to shine a light on what's happening. Uh, the second thing is to, to ask questions and to raise the political temperature, to raise the political cost of, of not cooperating. But depending on, on, on the kind of arrangement and, and how it's organized, et cetera, et cetera, uh, your options for actually doing something about it might be limited. And, and that's something we simply have to live with. Yeah, maybe on gender issues and what we call feminist uh, diplomacy. It is something that we advocate with a number of other countries. We are deeply convinced that feminist diplomacy is one of the elements of an effort to create the conditions to promote peace and security. Uh, in terms of disarmament and arms control, it is also the case, the question is how much that 
feminist diplomats who can really contribute to creating or recreating the conditions for a proper uh, international discussion on that kind of issues. But if it is part of the solution, I think that France has made its part because uh, six on six of the uh, permanent representatives to organization devoted to security issues, I mean NATO, uh, COPS or the PSC at the European level, IAEA, uh, Geneva, and uh, two other ones that I don't remember, all the six uh, for France are, are women. So um, really, if having more women implied in or involved in security issues and international negotiation related to peace and security is a factor of promoting peace and security. I think that we have made our part with over examples and over countries, of course. <laughs> is this one working? Thank you. Um, just on the point about the OPCW uh, and uh, shining a light, I think, and the, the concern about uh, non-compliance and breaches of the norms and what that means also for other instruments, absolutely agree. It's really important that we do shine a light. And I think that was very important that those questions have been asked, led by Germany and others, of indeed what Russian military personnel have themselves to confess to uh, on, on TV. Uh, and it's important if we don't like the answers that we get or don't believe that the answers are credible, that we continue to press those concerns. I think in uh, the OPCW, this has taken place actually over the last decade, uh, ever since uh, the concerns about Syria's mass use, uh, then signature and ratification of the convention and then non-compliance, frankly, ever since then, uh, we have made sure uh, and it's not just a, a UK, US, uh, France, Germany uh, issue. It's an issue that's shared by the vast majority of OPCW, of, of CWC signatories, that we have continued to press for full compliance with the convention. And it's really important that we do that and don't just fudge issues. I think last week in particular in The Hague, uh, the, the decision that was passed on Syria that, that Guillaume mentioned um, was an important one to, to recognize that still 10 years on, they are still failing to comply with the requirements of the convention. And this is not just something that will be time served and we will sweep under the carpet as really an issue that was, you know, is, is, is to want to be filed under the historical records. It is important that we keep the focus on that. It's also important that where conventions need to be strengthened to enable better verification, to enable uh, investigation of use that we do that and that's also happened in the in the uh, CWC context and we are all working collectively to try and improve the BTWC so that we can uh, have a uh, strengthened mechanisms there. I think certainly another area perhaps where Russia's failure to answer the question substantially harmed Russia is that they were voted off the OPCW Executive Council last week as well. So uh, there are many ways in which states can demonstrate their keenness that people comply with conventions and there are penalties for non-compliance. Thank you. I'm sorry to take the floor again, but I, I noticed we didn't answer the question about climate and it, it's clear that climate change will have an impact on, on security. I mean, there's, it's going to cause migration. It's going to cause a, a chase for resources. I mean, there are all kinds of resource competition eventually. Uh, this will affect the security environment and lead possibly to con conflict. And just one, one more comment on the feminist foreign policy agenda, which for the United States government is, is we talk about women, peace, and security. And, and the only thing I would say is, is there's a top-down element to it. I mean, it's a, you look at representation in international organizations or the number, you know, whether you have women as ambassadors in a number of, of, of embassies, but you also have to think of it in terms of a bottom-up approach. I mean, the important thing is to have both genders represented at every level of every, you know, government body, uh, local city council, uh, it's it's something that they have to be part of the security equation from the very beginning. It's not only a matter of of having 
uh, somebody at the top of the chain, even though that's that's one of those sort of visible indicators of how well we're doing. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have to come back. Uh, one, to apologize for my sugar alarm that went off. <laughs> but I think to, there was a very good question on trust that was posed, and I, I, I failed to answer that. I think it's an important question. Um, because, at least according to the Secretary General, this is the core of the matter. And why we are where we are. And when I was making my remarks, I did say that we focused a lot on the, you know, the tension between states. But we haven't focused sufficiently on what is happening within states and how it affects what is happening between states. Now, if you sit back and a little bit and look at politics nowadays within states, it's become almost like a performance, you know, where the most outrageous person gets the loudest ovation, and the loudest ovation translates into the largest number of votes. Yesterday, I think one of the EU principals, I cannot remember if it was Mr. Wagner or Mr. Borrell, made a very important point that nuclear conversations and uh, issues of, um, uh, of, of, of the like are actually very complex conversations um, in an increasingly complex world. So it's an issue that requires some sober, you know, environment. Now, possession of nuclear weapons have become some kind of political testosterone in which, you know, I have mine and it's better and bigger than yours. And, you, you know, it's almost like having candies. Now, we used to think of nuclear conversations and non-proliferation as very sober subjects, you know, but when the attitude within internal politics is such that you're almost watching reality TV, it makes you weak to the clapping audience to concede to your adversary. So when nuclear conversations get caught in this reality TV politics that you have nowadays, it makes it doubly difficult to be able to get the trust of your, adver of your, of your strategic uh, uh, adversary. And that is the reason why, really, at the end of the day, the internal dynamics, uh, political dynamics, do not help uh, the, the, the geostrategic uh, tension between states. Because he who compromises is he who is weak, not he who is wise, which is the way it should have been. And those are very wise words. Um, oh, I see a lot of questions. We're not going to be able to, uh, to get all those in because we have five minutes. So I'm going to take uh, three uh, speed questions. Uh, <laughs> let me hear in front the lady. Yeah, no, you don't, you don't need to look behind you. I'm pointing to you. <laughs> and um, then, um, uh, uh, Fearlem. Um, and then maybe over on the other side, uh, um, I don't know your name. Yeah, you. <laughs> the young lady. The young, yeah, yeah, the young lady there. So um, we can only take three. I'm really sorry. Um, so please, uh, first here. Thank you for your wonderful remarks. I'm Yitong and I'm part of the Next Gen Initiative and previously was the BWCISU at the ODA. And since some of you have adjusted like high technology and my question would, uh, would be is linked to like um, security. So for example, Elon Musk, he previously re rejected to provide um, the satellite, um, the startling satellite communications network to Ukraine for his military actions in Crimea in the fear of a Russian nuclear response. And my question is that in the case that some uh, tech giants um, whose business priorities might not necessarily align with international security or the national interest of like US in this case, um, how could uh, states either guide the 
the tech giants to the right directions and prevent them to fall into the wrong hands. For example, let's say if Starlink was sold to um, like some terrorists who paid a high fees, like that's just a hypothetical question. Thank you. All right, thank you. I think that allows for a whole panel, but we'll try and get a very short answer to that. And then we have Vele right here. Hi, thank you for, for your remarks, uh, very much appreciated. I would have a question based on um, a comment made by Ambassador Turner. You said that um, Russia is, is to some extent holding hostage international institutions by its veto power. So my, my question would be, what we, would be your view on revising the, the P5 veto power? Um, and of course the question is now posed to you, but maybe also to, to the other uh, France and UK panelists. Um, I mean, would that be a trade-off that you would be willing to make? And if not, why not? Thank you. Oh, I see another whole panel discussion coming up. <laughs> <laughs> so Final question. Park, I'm a mineral physicist, also a part of this next gen. Uh, I really appreciated the remarks on the FMCT that you made, which is only fully effective to the extent that all the states producing fissile materials actually sign and ratify the treaty. So how do we move from the verbalized support to actually enforcing the treaty when these geopolitical tensions are just increasing? Or how do we incentivize the PRK, Pakistan, PRC, as well as United States that is trying to restart the plutonium pit production facilities? Thank you. And that's panel number three. <laughs> we'll have another conference. So uh, very quickly, um, three questions uh, on, on how states can deal with tech giants, on the revision of the veto in the Security Council, and then of, on incentivizing uh, DPRK. Um, Adi, would you like to start again? Uh, no, no, not this no. time. Uh, OK, <laughs> that's a very honest answer. Rebecca, would you like to start? we we'll take the reverse order. It um, was about the role of tech giants. None of those are quick answers, as you've said. I but know. I think on the role of tech giants, um, the important thing is to engage, to understand and to regulate where necessary. So ideally through engagement and norm setting and standard setting, which we need to do rapidly given the technological advance, uh, we can protect our immediate security interests, but ultimately uh, it's uh, for states to regulate uh, where needed. Thanks. Maybe on P5 and the UNSC, it is something important and that's why as friends, we advocate for uh, the reform of the uh, format of the United uh, Nations Security Council for the one and for the f your, your question exactly on uh, the veto right we have pushed an initiative about self-restraining of any use of the veto as uh, as soon as you know a massacre of civilians or uh, mass um, you know onslaughts are, are uh, uh, in uh, on the agenda so it is something that we have uh, suggested, but with no, no great success uh, yet. <laughs> um, on how to incentivize DPRK. They go off and off. Okay, I'll use yours. I'm happy to use any one. Um, on the P5 question, I mean, the paradox, of course, you have to have P5 agree to change the P5 arrangement, which seems like a pretty a pretty tough thing. I mean, there, there was progress in the sense that now every time the, the veto is used, there's there's an obligation to explain that veto vote to the, to the to the UN General Assembly. So that's that's I think useful because it will put some political pressure um, on Russia, which has used the veto power, you know, far more often than anybody else. Uh, but uh, at least put them under some political. In terms of incentivizing the DPRK, um, I don't have any uh, brilliant answers for that. Um, I, I was involved in the, in the Cato Agreed Framework many, many, many years ago. Um, yes. And, you know, at the time we said to ourselves, you know, every day is a day, one, that the, the DPRK has not become a nuclear power. Now, but we clearly lost that part of it. Um, I think you've heard some of the discussion in the last couple of days about getting a P6 type arrangement going again, something along that line. But that would require that um, you know Russia and the PRC are generally committed to working out some sort of a um, an international arrangement to, in that regard. And it would also require that the DPRK be prepared, in principle, to eliminate 
all of its nuclear weapons. And as we've seen in the last couple of years, the DPRK is clearly moving in a very different direction and essentially trying to declare that it is a, should, is a nuclear weapons state. So, um, and for the moment, it's being protected uh, more or less by Russia and China in the UN Security Council, which has made it impossible then to, to pass any sanctions or resolutions against what they're doing. And the last words are for you. I, I really don't have much to add except on non-state actors. Yeah. I still think that uh, the peace and security issues, including uh, non-proliferation, uh, and nuclear disarmament have to be more attentive to non-state actors, both the positive and the negative actors. Uh, and that is just that alarm that I want to sound. Uh, I think that whether you are talking about armed groups or private companies or civil society, or indeed, multi-billionaires, you know. I remember on, in Ukraine, it just took um, a billionaire uh, to switch off one of his systems, you know, uh, and we were all trembling, you know. So I think we should make this conversation to be states plus. Um, and we have to put a lot more, I think, attention on on the role of non-state actors, both good and bad. Uh, otherwise, the whole thing becomes state-centric in a world that is, you know, uh, um, in which states, of course, are still important, but it's a lot more uh, to the global system. It's no longer an international system. It's a global system. And that gap between international relations and global relations <laughs> in which the threats we face are not international threats, but often planetary threats, in which states are necessary but not sufficient. I think we need to pay more attention to that gap. Uh, that's what I would say more broadly. Thank you. Well, these are very nice words uh, or very nice thoughts to, to end our discussion on. Uh, we've already gone a little bit over time, so I'm really sorry I couldn't get all the questions in. There were, there were a lot out there. But it does mean we have a lot of food for thought and uh, reasons to continue our discussions in, in next iterations. Um, I want to ask you to join me in uh, giving a big thank you to our panelists. Thank, thank you very much for, for joining us in the, in the panel. Um, uh, we, we end this panel. Um, the next uh, speaker is Sibylle Bauer as chair of the Non-Proliferation Consortium. I think we can s stay here in order not to disrupt. She will just deliver some closing remarks uh, from, from the lectern. Sibylle. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bayulain, for the introduction. And thank you for a very, very interesting and stimulating panel. I think we could have continued still for some time. But it's time to conclude now. And I must say that it has been wonderful to see old friends, new friends and colleagues. Um, and I think many of you have said that it's been very important to gather here, to reconnect, but also to make new connections across the globe. And during the pandemic, when we had the conference online, we had some discussions that maybe we should keep it that way to be more environmentally friendly. But I think it's also become clear that in-person interaction is still important. It plays a key role in building and maintaining relationships and building and maintaining trust. So thank you all for coming in person. And thank you to the EU for funding this event and for making it possible for us together. As I've often said, and I can't emphasize enough, it cannot be taken for granted that the EU funds independent research on non-proliferation disarmament issues, that the EU funds the exchange between policymakers and experts, 
and that the EU funds not only a network of think tanks, but also the building of a broader non-proliferation and disarmament community. Not only in Europe, but also connecting us with the US and with other regions that are present here. So no action, no money, and no, I, sorry, no, no un money, no action, I turned that around. <laughs> um, and I think it's a really important point that was also made yesterday. It would be really cool if in the future we have an African network of independent non-proliferation think tanks, a Latin American one, a Middle Eastern one, an Asian one. Mm -hmm. So I have the hope that maybe here in the audience, in the virtual audience elsewhere, there may be some think tanks, universities that are champions to take that forward in different regions and some governments that may be willing to put up the funding. As I said, if there's no money, we won't have conferences like these and no networks. So I had the privilege to conclude the annual conference a number of times now. And I must say that at some point I got a bit worried as we were moving from year to year, from crisis to crisis that everybody would keep on lamenting that things are falling apart, uh, a lot of doom and gloom. And I have to say that our world is definitely in very bad shape. And that's not only due to the great power tensions, but we are now seeing wars that we didn't see a couple of years ago. But I must also say at this conference, and also at many other consortium activities that we've had, I haven't actually seen too much of that lamenting and desperation, which I think leads to paralysis. But I've seen a lot of problem-solving willingness and attitudes. And I've also seen a reinforcement of efforts to come together and find solutions, especially given the urgency of the situation. You're facing a polycrisis. And as Adidei said earlier, complexity should be no excuse for inaction. I think that's a really, really important one to keep in mind. And the focus on solutions and ideas for moving forward was also something that was very evident at the Next Generation workshop that we had yesterday. There were lots of good ideas, fresh ideas. And actually, I wish that all of you had been present at the Next Generation workshop to listen to that. One of the things that we heard yesterday is that we may need to wait for warmer weather politically. <laughs> And I would like to take that analogy one, analogy one step further. Um, I had recently bought some tulips in the Netherlands, and I was instructed to plant them just before the first frost, before um, temperatures go, go below zero. So I did that in the expectation that there will be beautiful tulips in the spring. So I think what we should be doing is expecting spring to come, and we should be planting tulips. So this is the call for all of us. On that note of optimism, because I also really appreciated that many of you were trying to not just end um, on a positive note, but start on a positive note or uh, make some constructive contributions to the discussion. I would like to quote from a participant in one of our next generation activities. And they wrote just a few days ago, I come from a multinational, multi-ethnicities, multi-religion family, and I've lived in different places and cultures. I personally believe there is hope that most of the world's problems can be solved and humanity can move forward. I thought that was beautiful. And that sense of hope and expectation of a brighter future is also something that we've seen in many other educational activities that we've organized um, at CIPRI. For example, at the concluding session of the Armament and Disarmament Summer School that we organized, the last concluding session was almost like a feel-good movie. <laughs> because all the participants were sharing how uplifted they felt by connecting with the very different other students. Um, we had a very diverse group, and a number of them said, I never thought I would meet somebody from that country, religion, whatever background, let alone talk with them, let alone make, become friends with them. So that sense of uh, cutting through the labels and meeting the others as humans and connecting was extremely powerful. And given a lot of the doom and gloom that we hear in the news, I think it's really nice to have that sense of uplifting, which was very sincere. 
And uh, I'm also convinced that just as important as listening to different perspectives and different voices is a commitment to dig deep and think critically and get to the facts and to try to navigate this mist of misinformation, disinformation. And I think this makes educational non-proliferation disarmament issues even more important. What's strange, though, is that there's still a big lack of teaching on non-proliferation disarmament arms control uh, on these issues in universities across Europe, across the world. Not just in the social science disciplines, but even more so in the natural science and technical science disciplines. So this is something that I think we need to change and we can change. So perhaps we could not only reinforce our education activities going forward, I think it would be great to create a whole university network to be dedicated to strengthening teaching on these issues and also to make the, make the teaching more diverse. So as we move forward with this wonderful network that we have, we will continue to bridge gaps between the policy world and researchers, between policy and science, between natural and social sciences, and also within these sciences, because as you all know, there's many stovepipes within these disciplines as between the disciplines. Bridging gaps between academia and policy research and between the different countries and regions that we all come from. So I have a list of thank yous to conclude, and I would like to start with thanking our friends from YAI, especially Ettore and Manuel, but also the whole team that has been supporting us throughout the two days. Um, without logistics, there's no conference. So thank you all, and please help me in thanking them through a round of applause. But there are also a couple more thank yous. Um, I've already thanked our generous funders, but I would also like to thank our wonderful colleagues from the EIS and FBI for the excellent cooperation. And also personally, Marjolaine, for your great support of this activity. And uh, I would also like to thank all the consortium colleagues that have been collaborating in this conference, the network representatives, the speakers, and all of you for traveling here in person and making this a priority. It's been really, I think, a great conference. Um, and I look forward to seeing many of you again in Brussels next year, hopefully in a more peaceful world then. But it's not quite over yet because we have dinner ready downstairs from 6.30, so the practical feeding is also important as feeding the intellect. And to all the mentors and mentees, please stay in this room because we will also be gathering for another meeting. So with that, thanks again. Thank you.